Good evening, Asia. Welcome to the last episode of Birding Destinations here on the Asian Bird Fair online talk. Thank you for joining us tonight on Zoom and here on Facebook Live. Tonight, we bring you to Peru with Gunnar and Blong of Colibri Expedition. So if you're ready, let's say buenos dias, Peru. Como estas, Gunnar? How are you, Gunnar? Buenos dias, Mike. I'm good here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. This is going to be quite exciting. We're all excited to know why we have to go to Peru. So if you're ready, we're all ready. <laughs> all right. Uh, shoot, I'm going to share my screen here and hope everyone can see that. Um, just get my glasses on so I can see what I'm doing. Now, am I sharing, right? And I will put yes. that on um, like full full page, right? Does that work? Yes. Okay. All right. I, I actually started with the wrong slide. Let's go back here a little bit. Oh, uh, wait, can I do this a little bit better? All right, uh, do this backwards. Okay, so here, here we go. Um, well, uh, thank you everyone for joining me uh, this morning uh, here in Peru. It's morning over where you are, maybe it's night already. So I'm having my morning coffee while Richard have, is having his evening beer. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, we just uh, woke up here in Peru, and uh, I, I am actually going to answer Mike's question, why Peru? Well, right now, uh, Peru is actually doing pretty well, so if anyone's sort of considering traveling, if you are allowed to leave your country, some, I know some of you aren't, but those of you that can do, uh, Peru is in a good state right now. International flights have resumed. We flights that are less than eight hours. That means that all of the American hubs are open to uh, people that want to visit Peru. The only thing you have to take into account is that you have to have a PCR COVID test that is less than 72 hours. And um, you also, while you're flying and when you arrive to Peru, you will have to wear not only a face mask, but also a screen. And uh, that is also mandatory on the flights. Okay. So uh, it is uh, quite possible to visit Peru right now. Numbers are going down. Hospital beds are getting less occupied. And uh, feels the atmosphere is a little bit more relaxed, even though people are still wearing masks, of course, in public. Uh, there are lots of COVID uh, policies in place when you go to restaurants and shopping malls, etc. The quorum are reduced to um, just 50% in most places. So uh, uh, I just came back from traveling in central Peru with two uh, foreigners, two uh, tourists, uh, two birders, one from the UK and one from uh, the US. And uh, we were out in the field for 25 days and didn't, didn't run into any major problems and saw lots of birds, of course. So that was uh, quite nice for a change to be able to travel again. And uh, so in this uh, talk, I will talk a little bit about our classical circuits, the, the sort of main circuit of Peru. They include the classic Southern Circuit that is sort of along the main tourist track that everybody that are non-birders when they come to Peru visit. Then we have the Northern Peru birding route, which is uh, has been heavily marketed in the last uh, decade or so. And it has some spectacular bird, including the one of our logo, the marvelous spatchel tail. Uh, but lots of uh, nice birds and uh, lots of good new birding lodges and a lot of resources also for bird photography. And then I'm going to come back closer to my own home, uh, which is central Peru, 
uh, Lima is situated in central Peru. And from here, we can go inland and we can cover a lot of different habitats in a very short time. And it's also less expensive because we don't have to use any internal flights for that. So those are the sort of three major routes that we have in Peru. So uh, to start with, uh, Peru, for most people, well, they will probably not come for the birds. They will come for our very rich cultural history and the uh, foundation of the Inca Empire, of course, that Peru is built upon. And uh, here is a, a very big bird that, that you have to see from the sky. It's a hummingbird. It's one of the Nazca lines. And you have to use the flight to, uh, to appreciate these figures in the desert that I think this is about 100, 112 meters long or something like that. It's an incredibly large hummingbird. And um, it's also the speculations whether these were made by aliens or if it's the Peruvians themselves that have made them. Uh, you, you've probably heard the name Deniken. He had some theories about this uh, some 30 years ago or so. Uh, another uh, area that people want to visit is the Titicaca Lake, of course, so that, that we share with Bolivia. It's one of the, they usually call it the highest navigable lake in the world. I don't know if that's uh, cor absolutely correct, but uh, there used to be at least a steam liner that crossed the lake from Peru to Bolivia. And it's also famous for these floating islands where uh, uh, people build their homes on reed bed islands that are sort of anchored into the shallow water of, uh, of the Titicaca Lake. And from here, people do uh, fishing and hunting and, and even have agriculture on these small little islands that can grow potatoes on there. But uh, the main draw of uh, Peru is obviously one of the new seven wonders, Machu Picchu, probably the most popular. Uh, when they did this uh, contest some a few decades ago about the nominating the new Seven Wonders, Peru was uh, the favorite and uh, number one on that list. And the other ones are, uh, as you probably know, they are in Rome, the Colosseum, the Petra in Jordan, uh, the Christ statue in Rio de Janeiro, uh, Chichen Itza in Mexico the Chinese wall and the, I always forget, <laughs> forget one or two, but uh, yeah, uh, anyway, the, those are the new seven wonders. And uh, Machu Picchu has opened again for tourism, uh, also again with a limited number of uh, people allowed to be visiting at one time, one has to make reservations and so forth. But uh, yeah, you can come and visit uh, Machu Picchu anytime. And um, in recent years, uh, the new thing in Peru and the sort of very popular thing is the Peruvian food. Uh, it's not like we haven't eaten before, but the rest of the world had all of a sudden discovered the Peruvian cuisine. And uh, this is the star dish, the most famous dish called ceviche. It's uh, made of uh, uh, raw fish that is mar marinated in lime and uh, chili peppers and with red onion, and then this is served, uh, and also coriander, and then this is served with sweet potatoes and corn that is roasted but not popped. And it's one of the favorite dishes. Much of this uh, gourmet revolution is because of uh, a famous Peruvian chef called Gaston Acurio, who has opened restaurants in many places, in many capitals around the world, and uh, uh, making this um, Peruvian food, uh, the, the flag, uh, flagship of, uh, of the Peruvian cuisine is perhaps the ceviche and has become very famous. Another uh, uh, also popular dish that the tourists gets quite hor horrified about is the, the guinea pig. Uh, here you can see the guinea pig uh, roasted and uh, that's the traditional uh, dish that is eaten uh, on special occasions like weddings and and uh, birthdays etc especially high high up in the andes 
and uh, some of the tourists like to uh, try that out also. There's not a lot of meat on a guinea pig. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think I prefer them as pets rather than having them as a meal. But there are a lot of very, very colorful birds in Peru. And uh, I think uh, more and more, uh, even those general tourists that are only going for the culture will uh, discover the birds also. There are certainly a lot of birds in Peru that would attract sort of non-birders as well. And the more resources we get to see these birds with feeding tables and so forth, I think the easier it will be to also market Peru as a, as a birding destination or, or bird watching. Bird watching can be done also by sort of non-birders. And uh, on this picture, we see golden tanager. Uh, we see yellow scarf tanager, which is an endemic to Peru. And uh, there is paradise tanager and scarlet belly mountain tanagers. All these can be seen uh, on the east slope in the cloud forests of so the east slope and the foothills uh, uh, all over Peru, actually. And uh, so even if you go to south or to northern Peru, you are still able to see this. Then we have, of course, the hummingbirds of Peru that are also very, very popular, uh, also among non-birders. And the star bird is the um, marvelous patchy tail, of course, up here in the left upper corner. and. Uh, that occurs only in the Amazonas department in northern Peru. Then we have the um, sword-billed hummingbird with the body that is bigger than, well, as long as the body. Uh, the bill is as long as the body. There is a uh, royal sun angel in northern Peru and the uh, uh, red-crested, uh, rufous-crested coquette that is also in the lowlands, in the foothills in the lowlands from north to south and can be seen at various places at feeders. The uh, national bird of Peru is the Andean cock of the rock, again on the east slope in the foothills and the mountains. Uh, there are places where you can just sort of get off the vehicle, walk down five meters or so, and you will be on a platform and the lake is about 10 meters away. Fantastic for photography. And uh, this is on the Manor Road in Southern Peru where you can uh, have this easy access to the Andean Cock of the Rock. Uh, one of the uh, starbirds that I've been working with uh, a lot the last couple of months, now we are setting up a project I will tell you a little bit more about later, is the Andean Condor. And uh, this uh, has traditionally two sites in Peru where you go to see that in Colca Canyon in the south. Uh, recently, a couple of years ago, there was a new spot in Cusco called Chonta. And the last place now is in Lima where we're setting up this project where we can also see condors. I will show a video later, hopefully this will work. A video that I've been filming with my, with, just with my phone. And um, it's quite spectacular. It's only three hours from Lima, and we, oh, yeah. we've seen up to 26 condors at one time in this place. All right. Oh, oh dear. Uh, okay, so um, another uh, tourist attraction. Yeah, if, if people could turn off their mics, please, that would help. Thank you. Okay, so um, another tourist attraction that also non-birders go to in southern Peru are these famous macaulics. Uh, here on this picture, we see uh, uh, three different uh, macaws. There's the red and green here on top. There's a scarlet macaw, and there's a blue and yellow macaw. They come to these uh, licks of clay, uh, especially during the dry season, and they will uh, actually feed on these clay particles and it works a little bit like kaolin, cow you know, like uh, tranquilizing the, the toxins and the um, substances that they can't really digest that well uh, because the leaves and the flowers that they will eat during the dry season and the fruit, they may have some 
toxic compounds and it sort of neutralizes those uh, uh, compounds. And uh, this is quite a spectacle. And uh, the best time to, to visit this would be from May to October, November, more or less. It's less active during the rainy season. So it's something to take into account when you come to Peru. And if you go to the lowlands and you want to see this uh, amazing, uh, amazing show with the macaws. Uh, the best uh, macaw lick, I think, is uh, the ones that are on the Tambopata River because you see all these three macaws. There are also other parrots that come into the lick, a lot of smaller parrots and parrotlets and parakeets as well. And uh, all in all, there's just hundreds of birds flying in the sky at the same time, so all different colors. All right, so uh, let's get into the main section here. That was a little bit of an introduction. Uh, Peru is um, it's a fairly sort of recent, recent tourist destination because we had a lot of violence in the 70s and the 80s um, and the, the beginning of the 90s as well. And it was the Shining Path. You probably heard of this infamous uh, guerrilla uh, terrorist organization in, in Peru. Well, they were sort of uh, pushed back when they captured the leader in 1993. And from then on, uh, most of the country sort of started getting liberated. And little by little, the tourism has come back. And it's now, I think we're ninth or something like that in the Americas. So certainly uh, a lot more that can be done uh, in improvements and lodges, etc. But uh, we are uh, getting about 4.4 million tourists per year. And um, so it's a, uh, it's a fairly large country. It's about the three times the size of California. Uh, we have 30 million inhabitants. 10 million of those live in Lima. So the third live in Lima. And Lima is uh, situated here in the center of Peru, close to the coast. We're not at altitude here. Um, there are about 1,870 species uh, recorded for Peru. There are always new ones added. We actually got a boost of, I think it was about seven species just recently with uh, when the Rufus and Pitta was split and there were three new Tapaculas described. That's just this one this year. Um, and um, so that, that is quite exciting and we're getting more and more species that way. Traditionally, the people here in Peru, they will divide the country in the coast where Lima is all along the coast. This is the sort of most um, populous area in Peru. And then we have the Sierra, the Andes, and the Selva, the rainforest. So it's a transect of um, coast, mountains, and rainforest. However, for birding purposes, um, that transect is best done in sort of three sections, north, south, and central. And uh, each of these, if you cro make a cross section, it's quite easy to get 500 species plus in just one cross section. And if all of these have more than a thousand species uh, recorded altogether, about 1,200, 1,300, if you do a cross section like this uh, in any part of the country. So it's extremely diverse and every little valley here has different endemics. So it means that you cannot really do all of Peru in just one go. You need more than one trip. Uh, I played around a little bit to uh, try to set up shorter trips for different areas in Peru. And I came up with 10 different trips of five days. So that's 50 days of birding. And it's, I still don't cover all the areas. So it's definitely a multi-visit destination. So let's continue. Uh, let's start then with the uh, classic southern route. And uh, here we have. Uh, this is the same route that people that come and visit uh, Machu Picchu will do. They will start in Lima that I showed you on the map. Then they will go down to Paracas. They will continue via Nazca to the Nazca lines that I showed you on another picture. And then uh, they will eventually arrive to Arequipa. And, possibly do the Colca Canyon, which is in here, where they can see the condors. And then they continue to the uh, 
Titicaca Lake and uh, many times they will travel overland or they will fly to Cusco and then visit Machu Picchu. And if they have more time, they will sort of venture into the rainforest and most of the birds will do that. This is the famous Manu Road that goes here. This is a new tarmac road that goes down to Puerto Maldonado. You can also fly down to Puerto Maldonado. And from there, you can visit this uh, big uh, uh, national park here and uh, also the Manu National Park in this area. So if we start in Colca Canyon, uh, it's uh, one of the most dramatic canyons in the world. And there we can see uh, lots of condors at the same time. A lot of people come here just to see the condors. There's about 200,000 people coming to Colca Canyon per year. Not this year though. But uh, it sort of gives you a little bit of a um, perspective how popular this site is. And then uh, people will go to the Titicaca Lake. And uh, here there is an endemic bird. It's the Titicaca flightless grebe. It's the, for the birder, the main reason to go to Titicaca. But it's a, also a species that we share with Bolivia. And then, of course, we continue to, uh, to uh, Cusco. And Cusco was the capital of uh, the Inca Empire. And there are lots of uh, Inca remains in the city, a lot of the churches and the uh, sort of uh, bigger houses are built on foundations on Incan walls. And they are perfectly fitted together, uh, uh, massive uh, pieces of rock that are fitted together. And mind you, the Incas, they did not have the steel, they did not have the wheel, and they did not have any horses to uh, actually pull these big pieces of blocks uh, from one point to the other. So everything was done by manpower. And um, I guess they had to shisel out these uh, uh, rocks uh, little by little and a bit of trial and error to fit them in. And there are some uh, interesting studies that uh, show how this could have been done. Within these walls, there are some, uh, you can see sort of indents, and they think they've pulled them up on poles and uh, then shiseled the, uh, the part underneath to fit with the pre-fabricated uh, stone that they put on top. That way they didn't have to lift it and take it up uh several times but just had to fit it in at one go anyway uh so uh the sort of the end of this tour would be much a picture this is the uh, the uh, citadel that is very uh, beautifully dis situated on top of a saddle between this uh, Huayna picture mountain and the and the Machu picture mountain that you would have behind you and it's uh circled almost a complete uh, at least 270 degrees circle that the river does uh, get back on the front the river does around this sort of um saddle that comes out into the river and um, the sun would hit this uh site on the winter solstice almost uh, right when the sun comes up and at the sun temple so they think it has been a, like an observatory uh, in Incan times. The interesting thing about Machu Picchu was that it was totally forgotten uh, when the Spaniards arrived. So nobody had heard about it uh, for a long time until 1911 when Hiram Bingham uh, made some explorations in this area and found these ruins with the help of uh, local people. And uh, near Machu Picchu, you can see things like the torrent duck. They're quite common in the river there. If uh, you have a few more days uh, near uh, Cusco, you will visit Abra Malaga. Abra Malaga is a very endemic rich area and it has some polylepis woodland, fantastic scenery with beautiful mountains. You can do some hikes there. Uh, and there's both temperate forest and subtropical forest and there's some dry woodland and uh, lots of endemics including this uh, royal synclodus that lives in the um, polylepis woodland 
Now there is also a place nearby where they put up feeders and it's a great place to see sword-billed hummingbird up close. The uh, main attraction from Cusco, however, is the Manu Road that goes down to the Manu Park and it cuts through lots of different habitats. There are more than a thousand birds uh, recorded on this route. And you start in Cusco and you go down this road through, uh, or first through in, into Andean valleys, and then you come down uh, to uh, some lodges uh, up in the subtropics. Uh, one is called Waikecha. You come further down to, uh, well, you pass Pacartambo and you come down to something called uh, uh, Kilcopata. And down there, you have uh, uh, two other lodges called Am Amazonia Lodge and uh, well, there are several lodges as well. And the other one is called the Carmen that we use. We also use the lodge that is called Cock of the Rock Lodge. And all this area is, uh, well, you need a minimum of five days. We do a five day tour down this, but you can easily spend two weeks. And then you can venture lower down into the Manor National Park proper where you also have Macaulay's, et cetera. So uh, one of the first stops is the Cock of the Rock Lake. Uh, which I told you about, which is only like five meters off the road. Uh, when you come down to the lowlands, you may see the amazing Huatzin. It's a unique bird in its own family. It looks a little bit prehistoric. It's also a bird that the young has uh, claws on the wings. So when they, they are pretty miserable uh, creatures. They're, they're sort of very defenseless. They can't fly but they can swim. So if they get a predator coming close to the nest, they will simply drop down into the water. They swim with their rudimentary wings. And the, since they have the claws on the wings, uh, they can climb up the next tree and sort of that way escape predators like snakes or similar. And they are also known for smelling very bad. They, have a, they are total leaf eaters. They eat these aralia leaves and fruits uh, that uh, virtually no other birds feed upon. And uh, as leaves are very hard to digest, they have a, a bacteria in their guts or, or the crops that will dissolve these leaf, leaves and hence they will smell. So it's not a bird, even though it's fairly big, it's not hunted by any means and it's quite common in these marshy areas in the lowlands of the Amazon. And I mentioned the Mikolik already, uh, there is one also on the Manu Road uh, at the very bottom that you can visit. It does only have uh, red and green Mikos though uh, these other two big Mikos do not come to the lick there but you usually see those uh, up close anyway during your trip into the lowlands. All right, so let's uh, head on then to the uh, northern circuit. And um, this is the one that has been popularized by Prom Peru at the bird fairs, etc. cetera. And uh, there are an astonishing amount of very, very nice birds to see here. Uh, it starts in the, in the western part where we share this region, this endemic bird region called the Tumbesian region. We share that with Ecuador. And there are a number of birds that you can only find in this region. And the ones that are special for Peru are, for instance, the white winged guan and the Peruvian, uh, sorry, the Tumbes tyrant. And uh, then you continue over the pass, the Purcuya Pass, where you get things like. Eventually, you come into the dry Marañón Valley, which has uh, Peru, and eventually, going eastwards, you will come to the famous area of Pomacochas, where the, the marvelous bachelor tail lives, and the Abra Patricia area, uh, where you find the long whiskered owlet and uh, uh, a lot of other endemic birds, such as the Lulus or Johnson's toady tyrant. And uh, slowly but surely, you will come into uh, lower areas near Moyobamba. It's like a plateau, a savanna like plateau with some rainforest patches uh, at around 1,000 meters. 
and then we drop down to Tarapoto. From Tarapoto, you can also make a flight into Quitos in the heart of the Amazon, the northern Amazon of Peru. So if we start a trip on the west, uh, we have a lodge called Chaparri. Uh, it's dry woodland here. This is one of the best places to see the white winged guan up here in this picture, a bird that was uh, known from only one specimen from 1877. And uh, it was thought it was lost until a hundred years later, it was discovered, rediscovered uh, and uh, in dry forest. They thought, uh, the, the problem with this bird was that they were looking at the wrong places. They thought it was a bird that had lived in the mangroves, but it turned out that it lived in the foothills of this dry forest in the Tumbesian area. And it has only been recorded so far in, in Peru. And there are no records in Ecuador, which is kind of strange because the first birds were actually collected very close to the Ecuadorian border. Um, but here at Chapari, they have made the reintroduction program. And uh, now uh, it's, I think it's still critically endangered, but it's uh, the project is going so well that it's almost on the sort of verge of being downgraded to uh, endangered only because of all these conservation projects that are in place and the reintroduction projects as well. And as I mentioned, also the Tumbus tyrant is another bird that we can see in this area. The uh, lodging here at Chapari is in these uh, rustic adobe uh, buildings, but they are fully um, equipped inside with hot showers and solar panels and electric light and so forth, and very, very comfortable. And the food is just amazing. And here's the Chapari mountain here that you can see in the background. Uh, very close to uh, Chapari is another uh, forested area called Bosque Pomac. And this is a, a great place to see some of the endemic birds that are unique to Peru, including the Peruvian plant cutter uh, down here and the Rufus flycatcher. It's also a, a very good place to see the white tailed jay that we share with Ecuador, another Tumbesian endemic. As I mentioned, we go over the pass, the pass uh, at Abrapurcuya, uh, coming into the Marañón on the other side. It's one of the lowest passes in the Andes. It's only about 2,200 meters high. And here we find uh, some mountainous birds of this region that are also shared with Ecuador, some of them. And they are uh, this uh, uh, black cowl saltator, uh, the pure at Chat tyrant is endemic for Peru. And uh, here is the elegant crescent chest, a unique family. The crescent chest is, I think it's has only like four or five members. And uh, we can see two different crescent chests on this tour. Because when we slip over into the Marañón side of the Valley of Dry, inter Andean Valley, with lots of endemism as well, we find the Marañón endemic, uh, Marañón crescent chest. Uh, which has these white uh, fringes to the coverts and it's uh, somewhat richer colored underneath as well. Uh, we also find the Peruvian pigeon there or the Marañón pigeon and a subspecies of the slady, northern slady anthrax that is endemic also to the Marañón Valley. This is in the, in the northern part of the Marañón uh, on this route. Uh, we also go to the southern section and they have some other birds. Uh, here we find the buff bridal dinka finch, one of the, the, well, the prettiest of the Inca finches, I would say. There are five Inca finches altogether. All of them are in Peru. And uh, we can see uh, on, a, on a circuit in uh, northern Peru, we see three of these. Uh, we also have the Marañón thrush, and the yellow-faced parrot, that a rare sort of version of, of the Pacific parrot that, that you find quite widespread on the west, western deserts of uh, Peru all the way down to Nazca now. Um, but uh, this uh, yellow-faced parrotlet is much rarer and only in the Marañón Valley. We continue east and we start going uphill again and we will come to Wembo. And Wembo is a um, place where they have 
a little bit of a reforestation project. There's a Peruvian NGO uh, called Ecoan who started this project and they get funding from, among others, uh, American Birding um, American Birding Association. Conservation, no, sorry. American Bird Conser Conservancy. And um, they have also put up feeders here where the marvelous spatula tail come. And uh, the marvelous spatula tail is perhaps uh, the most beautiful hummingbird in the world. Uh, there is a group called the uh, 363 Hummingbirds on Facebook that I'm an administrator for. And I've done a Hummingbird World Cup that you can check out. Uh, we're right now, we're on quarterfinals, I think. So uh, you can go in there and vote and see which will be the most popular uh, hummingbird in the world. My bet is that uh, Marvelous Batchetail will be in the final. Whether we will win or not, we'll see eventually. But it's absolutely a must see uh, bird. And uh, what it does is it will, uh, during November to March, April, more or less, they have these legs. Uh, the males will gather in uh, small groups and they will start performing this dance, either in flight or from a perch like this. They will wave their feathers up into the air, the spatches up into the air. And uh, they also do this in, in midair. They flex their wings and they wave the, the feathers up and down and um, waste a lot of energy. There's a fantastic uh, film sequence on BBC that you can check out. I think you will have to do a search. It's not on YouTube now, but if you do a search for BBC and Attenborough is narrating this uh, uh, display of the marvelous patch of tail. It's quite amazing to see. And uh, well, here's another picture. These are made by Max Vo that came on a trip uh, some years ago uh, with us. Uh, and he managed to get this great photos of uh, the marvelous spatula tail in, in doing its display. So uh, after that, we, we will continue to the Abra Patricia area. And uh, here uh, there are lots of hummingbird feeders. There is a good lodge uh, called the Owlet Lodge. And there is also a, a smaller place with only two cabins uh, called Fundo Alto Nieva, where one can stay as well. But this is a very, very interesting forest. It's the very stunted forest on the ridge tops, and it has a very unique uh, flora and fauna. And one of the birds that you can find there is this Lulu's toady tyrant, or also known as Johnson's toady tyrant. And uh, here is also the place for the royal sun angel, a beautiful hummingbird. And it now comes to feeders at the Alto Nieva um, feeding station. It's also a place where they started feeding ant pittas. Um, this is uh, the same recipe that has been used from Ecuador. If you remember the previous talk here, that we, you were showed uh, ant pittas of Angel Paz. He was the guy that came up with the idea of feeding them wor worms. These used to be the most difficult birds to see in the all of uh, the neotropics. When I first heard that they had were feeding them from the hand with worms in Ecuador, I could not believe it. I've been struggling to see uh, these anpitas crawling on the ground, very dense forest, doing imitations, very, very difficult to see. And now they have these feeding stations. This is a rusty tinge stamp pitta, endemic to Peru, of course. And here's another one, uh, also endemic, which is the ochre fronted ampita. This is the, the smaller genus, the Gralaricula genus. And uh, the previous one was Gralaria. And uh, these can be seen uh, at this Fundo Alto Nieva. Uh, both the Owlet Lodge and Fundo Alto Nieva has this mythical owlet also, the long whiskered owlet. This was uh, another very, very difficult bird uh, for many years. I think I, I did about six or seven tries to see, uh, to try to see one before I actually saw one eventually. Very, very difficult. 
And now there are uh, a few places. It, it, the story goes that it was collected first in the 1970s from mist nets. Nobody had seen them alive. And uh, it was uh, totally in mystery. Nobody, everyone tried to sort of go out at night, listen for weird sounds. Nobody knew what it sounded like until there was an LSU expedition in the year. I think this was in the, uh, the late, could have been like 1998 or so. Um, they made, or 1995, they made an expedition into um, uh, the same area, uh, but up the uh, Abra, uh, actually up the Patricia Mountain, Sarah Patricia itself. And uh, one of the researchers came back with a, uh, an owl in the bag, sort of that they collected in the nets, and they, Sort of when they opened it and saw it was the long whiskered owlet, everyone was in shock. And uh, he was like, wow. Uh, so they kept it in a tent, and that way they got a recording. Uh, so that recording was made, used later to try to get the, this bird to call back. And eventually, after a long time, it was found at uh, a few places. And it was not only in stunted forests, as was previously thought, but also in rather mature forests. It's a very small owl. They were considering it and may actually be flightless to start with, but it, it does fly. So now we know, but it, it doesn't have a very sort of developed sternum. Uh, anyway, uh, you should probably sort of give it a few days because if the weather is bad, they will not sing. So it will be hard to see. All right, uh, also further down, it's a great place to see the Rufus Crescent Coquette and Moyobamba. There are good places for that there. Also to feeders, there are a lot of hummingbird feeders everywhere in on the northern circuit. And you can see this amethyst uh, wood star, for instance. Uh, another uh, recently, fairly recently described bird is the um, scarlet banded barbet. We do an extension from the northern route south there. It used to also be a very hard bird to get. You had to climb this mountain. You had to do an expedition for over seven, eight days or so. You had to fly into first to Pucallpa from Lima, and then from Pucallpa you had to do a smaller flight into another place called Pampa Hermosa. There you hired a little boat called Peque Peque. They call Peque Peque because they go really slow with a one cylinder engine. They go Peque 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 Peque. That's what they sound like. And it takes two days to go up the river and then it took two days to climb this mountain to get onto the very top to see the Scarlet banded barber. Until this guy, Todd Mark, was doing some research, he was following this trail he had located on the map. And so he said, Well, if I just take this trail up to the highlands, maybe I will be able to see this uh, scarlet banded barber. So he came up to this place that was a um, former, former oil or natural gas drill platform, and they called it Plataforma. Um, and it was a little village up there and actually had a road coming up to it as well. He had just taken this trail. Uh, it's one of the worst roads in the world. <laughs> so one needs a special four wheel drive to get up there, but you can see the, this uh, Scarlet Valley Barber. So the project has only, uh, sort of this place has only been around for say six years or so. And, uh, it's kind of sad to come up there because you see all this forest destruction along the road all the time. And you know that the uh, bar bit is in there and you have to walk further and further, further and further away to find it. Uh, recently, there was a new bird discovered at the same spot. And this is, uh, was discovered by Josh Beck. Uh, it's called, uh, it was described, I think two years ago now. Uh, it's called the Cordillera Azul ant bird. And the same there, uh, a bird that was uh, totally unexpected. Josh had uh, had some extra time. He actually uh, hitched, hiked into the area, did not take the sort of uh, ex rather expensive private jeeps, but he hitchhiked in and had sort of waited to get back. But he sort of said to himself, well, um, let me just explore this trail going down from the soccer field. And he had only walked in a couple of hundred meters and he heard a sound that he was certain was not one that he had on his tapes. And it turned out to be uh, this new ant bird that looks somewhat similar to chestnut 
I think it's called it's Rufus Pact or Chestnut Pact Stanford of uh, of the Guyanan Plateau. Ferruginous uh, Pact, sorry, Ferruginous Pact uh, Antford. It's somewhat similar to that, but totally a different call. So it was described and it it, it lives in a uh, understory on the ground. It walks on the ground uh, in forest that is quite tall for being a um, foothill uh, type of forest where with lots of uh, ferns to set underneath. And uh, the place where it was first found is no longer there. So there's a lot of forest destruction in the area. And it's basically uh, coffee farmers that are uh, cutting down the forest. Hopefully little by little with more people coming to the area, uh, tourists will understand that this, well, the people in the area will understand that this is worth saving um, and they will get some income from this as well. So finally, uh, I'm looking at my watch here, I'm seeing that uh, I'm sort of running out of time, but this, this is the central Burden Peru and this is where I live in Lima and we are doing a lot of projects here. Um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit here. We have a close wetland called Pantanos de Villa that we go to where we see the great grebe, the uh, many colored rush tyrant, beautiful bird, um, Peruvian thick knee. And when we come down to the coast and the cliffs, we get the famous Inca tern and the red leg cormorant, beautiful birds on the coast. Here's the red leg cormorant in flight. It's also a great place to see blackish oyster catcher. And uh, we do a little tour also around the islands to see the humble penguin uh, that is, uh, lives in colonies in, on the Peruvian and Chilean coast. One can do pelagics also, they are a little bit down at the moment. We, uh, we used to have them from Lima, but there are uh, some, well, a little bit of red tape to use the, uh, the boats that we were using and the port authority said that they needed to invest some $20,000 in their boats to be able to take people further out. And uh, the operators weren't, simply weren't interested because they are quite happy to just sort of go around the island and throw people into the sea with floating devices to swim with the sea lions. That's their business. So unfortunately, now we only hire uh, occasionally boats from Paracas further south. But if you go into the Humboldt current, you are highly rewarded with things like the waved albatross, the, uh, Peru uh, oops, the Peruvian, um, uh, the Peruvian, diving petrel and the uh, hornbees or ringed storm petrel and the markham storm petrel among others. North of Peru is, uh, in, is an oasis called, north of Lima is an oasis called Lomas de la Chai that has fog vegetation where you can find least seed snipe and in the cactus you find the cactus canistero on the dry side of this uh, reserve. But uh, my uh, sort of Thing that I really want to uh, promote here is the Santa Eulalia Canyon, where we have started a new project uh, to uh, conserve condors. We actually are also going to build a hide with the help of uh, a friend of ours uh, that you know, Carlos Santana from Spain. He's going to help us uh, to do a feeding station and, and a hide for uh, condors coming into this area. I'm just gonna show you a little movie here that I made a two minute movie with the uh, condors flying uh, from this lookout point. This is from Lima. And uh, we uh, have been going up uh, every Saturday now, the last, well, since they opened up a little bit that we could do a little bit of local traveling, taking local Peruvians to see condors at close range. This is filmed on, only with my phone, uh, an old iPhone 6. And uh, it's quite astonishing really how close these condors come. And I had a group up here now on this last, when this was filmed, and they were, uh, they had been to uh, Colca Canyon in the South four times, and they had only seen two condors when they were there. <laughs> and now they came to uh, Santa Eulalia three hours, from Lima, and they saw 25 condors. 
in uh, to these cliffs to uh, sleep in the afternoon. So they will pass by. And apparently these ones had just been feeding because they had their crops really filled with uh, food items. Uh, came extremely close. So um, um, other things you can see in Santa Eulalia Canyon is uh, another um, Inca finch. This is the great Inca finch. And uh, higher up in the valley, you get the uh, white cheek Tatinga in Polylepis woodland. And if you cross over the pass that is at 4,900 meters, you get to these bogs uh, around 4,700 meters. And they have the one of the most wanted birds, perhaps, for people that come to South America and if they like shorebirds. There is this uh, diadem sandpiper plover, a unique bird of the highland bogs of Peru, Chile, and Bolivia. And one of the best places to see it is actually in Lima because it's it's only like three hours away. The altitude can be a problem, so it's a good idea to maybe have visited the islands before you do this trip. Uh, but we also So do a day trips uh, um, individuals um left sorry uh, the lake is uh, threatened by mining uh, there's mining residues coming into the lake uh, but it has been that way for a long time now it's also a regulated lake uh, it's used the water masses are used for hydroelectrical purposes uh, for a dam that is further down and obviously this uh, creates differences in water level that can affect these birds as well. Very little is known actually what it is that limits the, the numbers to stay around 300 birds and not increasing. We have been uh, trying to support a project here, um, trying to get some sort of more specific data from day to day to see how the numbers are varied. We haven't analyzed it yet, but we had this guy employed for about two years. Uh, taking measurements every day. His name is Cesar Ceballos, who's, who's been out there in, in the forest. He, he is also the guy that can show you the tuning rail, uh, a, a unique subspecies of the black rail, according to some authorities, and a good species, according to others. It's quite isolated here in this lake, of course, and it's only endemic here. If you continue further north, uh, one of my favorite spots uh, on earth is the Bosque Unchog. Uh, here you find the biggest tanager in South America. It's the golden back mountain tanager, a very, very rare uh, tanager that we scored on this, uh, my last trip to Central Peru. <laughs> this is a photo taken a few years ago. Now it is rainy season there right now, but nevertheless, if you sort of play your cards right and you go and bird in the morning, you can still do some pretty good birding. And uh, finally, uh, for this area, I, this is a very dear project of mine. Uh, we are uh, supporting the community lodge at uh, Satipa Road. This is the old building. They build a new one right now. And uh, we've just been uh, doing the first coordinations with the community. They are very happy to see Colibri expeditions administrating and improving and marketing the uh, the present lodge that uh, is just one building right now uh, no walls there are eight beds so uh, our next project is to put in uh, walls and separate to so we make four rooms make a little kitchen area but uh, above all to put up feeders and make it very bird friendly that's the whole point i think so we will be doing that and uh, there are some fantastic birds to be seen in the area. Uh, 
some that are totally new to science, some that are not even described yet. They don't have names. Um, here is, oops, on this uh, picture here is the black spectacle brush finch. Uh, here's the tapaculo that was unnamed for 40 years. It has just been described. It was used to be known as the undescribed milpo tapaculo in brackets. Now it's been described as Halka tapaculo or jalka if you pronounce it in English. And it lives in this sort of um, grass, tussock grass and rocky places. Finally, it got a name. And uh, here are two undescribed ones. One that I found is, is a wren called the plain tail. It's like similar to plain tail wren. Uh, it's in the Mantaro drainage. Um, I don't know what we're going to call it yet. I've suggested M&M &M wren, but I don't know if that will go down well. <laughs> here is uh, also a, an undescribed thorn bird uh, from the same area. So, uh, well, I was going to say here also with Satipo Road. So since we're running a project, I have a page up called the Satipo Road. Um, something with a Satipo Road project or lodge project, etc. There is a blog post. You can find it uh, easily on my pages. And uh, there's a fundraiser going on right now. And if you don't want to donate money, you know that Peru is open right now and I'm actually selling five days for $999. So you can go and see these uh, fantastic birds on the city of Road, help out the project at the same time and uh, uh, get your uh, birding done, your birding in the tropics done in spite of the COVID. So we will run these uh, $999 tours uh, for until March. And a special price every week uh, if we get at least, uh, well, we'll do it with one client or two clients or three clients. The price will still stay the same, yeah, $999. So there you go. Um, finally, I just wanted to mention a few unique things about our Colibri Expeditions trips. That It's some novel ideas that I've, I've done a few uh, uh, talks on. Uh, online that you can find on our YouTube channels about these ideas and it's something that you guys can copy as well. Uh, it is, uh, I think we have to find some novel approaches to bird watching trips. So what I've done in Peru is that I've uh, selected the best tours that we have uh, and made very short itineraries of only five days. So I have three itineraries right now and they are called Birding Peru Anytime. And the best birding itineraries of Peru that has most feeders, that have uh, the best lodging, and uh, are very accessible for almost anyone, and regardless of the kind of interest in birds that you have, if you're into photography or uh, if you are into endemics, etc. And especially if you have a limited time. So these five day tours, they can Usually they will run every Monday to Friday, so you can fly in one weekend and fly out the next if you only have that amount of time. And uh, if you have more time, you can sort of put these back to back and get a very good cross sample of the best birds of Peru. So try to find the raisins of your countries and sort of set up these sort of very short itineraries showing the very, very best. That way you will... Um, uh, you will target a larger market segment also of newbies, not only the hardcore birders that are in the end a very limited number. We need to popularize bird watching and make it more accessible to other people. Another idea I came up with also recently that we haven't tested yet because COVID came in between, but we have these uh, fantastic places for bird photography in Peru now. And most of the, uh, or at least many Asian bird watchers, they like to be in one spot, photograph the birds that are there. They don't want to go on trails because they can't carry their big tripods and the big lenses, etc. They'd rather wait for the birds to come to them. So we have set up a 12 to 13 day uh, unguided bird photography tour. And uh, so you don't need a guide. And if you don't need a guide, there are, of course, local personnel in each and every place. You just need that one driver that takes you to the different places and uh, you, some sort of a manual that you can put out and written even in, 
in Mandarin or in Japanese or whatever. You just have the same sort of manual in different languages. And then the photographers, of course, will know uh, what birds to uh, photograph, etc. So this is all all under uh, all under production, but it's something that I hope will work really, really well in the future. And uh, hope, hopefully we'll get a lot of Asian clients coming to do that. And uh, the third uh, novelty that we've done as well, we, we have done, tried this for some time now, but it's an idea of doing tiered pricing. Uh, what does this mean? Well, you know, if you go online and you want to buy something, you will have uh, some services online. You will see these sort of different price levels. You have the sort of budget version that doesn't really well, it's sort of trying it out, but it doesn't give you all the all the bells and whistles, right? And then you have the mid thing that, that is just about right. And then you have the deluxe version for or the the professional version that are if you're a heavy user or if you want to really want all the bells and whistles that you can possibly think of. Well, you can do the same thing in bird watching. So the the um, one of the big costs for a bird, operating a bird tour on the long run is the transport and the guide that you will have on the tour. So if you can spread that out in a larger group, well, if you limit it to just sort of the high end budget people, well, maybe you don't get enough people in the group then to actually cover uh, the costs and it will become extremely expensive. Or on the other hand, if you have a low budget uh, version of the tour, maybe you don't fill up with people that want more comfort and again you have too small of a group well rather than try to get the group size a little bit larger by having a flexible accommodation and flexible services so what we've done is that we have a real sort of no frills budget version where the uh, we put the uh, the clients in hostels or even camping in some places uh, we don't include the uh, the dinners. They will be on their own. They don't have to do the list at uh, the end of the night. Um, they will all be on their eBird anyway, right? So um, it may not be that necessary. And then we have sort of our standard, but we also include then a, a, like a pro version or, or a, we call it the Marvelous Patchet Tail, the Marvelous Patchet Tail Deluxe version where they have everything included, including alcoholic drinks, et cetera, and, and the most comfortable lodging. So you can have a tiered pricing that way. And uh, we also introduced, uh, and this is only for the Southern Circuit, where there are lots of different hotels, uh, Airbnbs, et cetera. We've done now the Southern Circuit with, t uh, with something that we call Colibri Flex. And it means that if you take this budget version and not including all the bells and whistles that we provide, then you can have your dinners on your own. You can have your, you can book your hotels on your own. And there are some of the excursions that are not included that you would pay extra for on the tour. So uh, this could work really, really well. And uh, finally, I, I, this is my last slide. So I'm going over time here now. <laughs> uh, I also wanted to mention my new project, the Seven Wonders Birding, that you've been hearing about when I've been on the on, on the bird, Asian bird fairs. And uh, this is something that you can replicate as well. It, again, the short tours. Um, on my last tour now, um, that I just finished a week ago, I had a, a hardcore birder, and he's has a uh, his wife is not a birder, but they like to go traveling together. So. He was sort of spinning his wheel, said, I have to come back to Peru. I have to see my next birds here. But maybe I should bring Angela with me to see Machu Picchu. And I had told him about this idea of the short tours and uh, with Machu Picchu, et cetera. And you can do that. So the key features to make this work, so you can combine birders and non-birders on the same tours, is that they are short. They have lots of wild factors, world heritage sites, spectacular birds that everyone wants to see. The key birds and the key families are sort of attracting the birders and uh, the bird families, the uh, unique bird families, some iconic mammals maybe, and uh, lots of great uh, photography opportunities and above all comf comfortable lodging. So use the best lodgings, don't, don't go cheap on that. And that way 
happy wife, happy life, as they say, right? So, uh, yeah, that was my last slide. Thank you very much, and welcome to Peru. So, uh, now, uh, are there any questions? You can turn on mics, I guess. Okay. I'm not hearing anything here. Are you? So. Thank you very much, Gunnar. That was a very comprehensive uh, discussion. <laughs> Any questions, guys? Uh, yes, I have a question. Okay, Bella. Okay, yeah, Bella. hi, Ghana. Yeah, it's, thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation, firstly. And uh, because I've never been to South America before, so I found that it can be a little bit confusion to me because all the South American countries, they have, they're so rich in birds. It's so diverse. So what is the most ad ad advantages of Peru compared with other countries in South America? That's my question. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, that is a very good question. And I think uh, in Peru, we, we do have the advantage is Machu Picchu, of course, you know. Uh, it's an absolutely stunning place to visit, and it also has some good birding. And uh, now, uh, I I can understand that it's very confusing for people in Asia to uh, if they've never been to South America, where should they start? You know, there are so many options, and uh, it's one of the reasons why I did these uh, uh, birding Peru anytime itineraries. Uh, mm -hmm. not to not to overwhelm but to present the very best uh, in one country uh, i think that's a, a that's a strategy that um, should be emulated maybe also in other countries so don't try to show everything but show the best in one tour and then if people get interested well they can make another tour uh, further on but it should be it should include not only not only the birds i think for people that have uh, have had no uh, no exposure to South America before, because as you say, it's it's extremely confusing and the diversity is so high. Uh, a mistake that a lot of people do is that they think that they will have to visit the Amazon first thing. Um, I would not recommend that because the birds in the Amazon can often be very difficult to see. There's too much forest in the way, so. I would rather concentrate in open areas um, and uh, where they have specific setups for seeing the birds well, you know, with good, good gardens and feeders, etc. And the cloud forest is much easier, gives you that tropical feeling still, but much, much easier to bird than the uh, lowland rainforest. Wow. All right. Thank you so much. I hope to meet you in Peru some days. Thank you. Yeah, or, or if not, I'll see you in China. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Any questions? Gunnar, I have a question. Since you just uh, ended the one month, uh, now, then compared to uh, no, I, I wouldn't say so. I think, well, maybe in some cases, but here in Peru right now, also, we are at the beginning of the rainy season, or it it's, has been going on for a while. So I think uh, we actually had some trouble getting some birds out because they, we think they're on nests right now. So they were not, uh, some of them weren't very responsive to our playback. Uh, having said that though, I mean, we still saw <laughs> a vast number of birds. And uh, having said that about the rainy season, we had surprisingly little rain. It rained when we were in the car or when at night. And uh, I, I think it was only one morning that we had to change plans because of rain. And we just decided, okay, let's carry on to the next place and we had a beautiful birding in the afternoon instead. So 
well, we missed a few things there, but we made up for other things in the, in the next area that we visited. Questions? Hey, I, I have a quick uh, question on the seven day tour. Um, so I understand that it's the best of the best, but it, it is it customizable? Uh, for example, I'm quite taken with a spatula tail, but my husband wants to see the bird with the mustache, the Inca turn. So, I mean, is that visible within the seven days? Plus, if we wanted to see Machu Picchu, is that an extra two days? Is that feasible? So, quite practical uh, question. Okay. Okay, no, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And if you only have the seven days, let's say you, you fly in and you reach, uh, you will be flying east, so uh, you will go through the time zone, I guess, so you will come to Peru almost on the same day as you're leaving. So say you could leave a Friday night or something like that and be in Peru on Saturday morning. So you effectively, you could get, uh, you lose a few days coming back though, but, but, um, Effectively, if you do the five-day tour in the north, yeah, you have, uh, when you arrive, the Inca turn is just a couple of hours, well, just an hour from Lima. So you can easily do that in the morning, before a flight, in an afternoon, uh, when you arrive, if you have, have that time. So that could be done as well. And then for Machu Picchu, it is uh, possible to do that within two days from Lima. So you take a really, really early flight to Machu Picchu, uh, sorry, to Cusco. You take a really early flight. They start leaving at 4 a.m. So you could basically be on the train and visit Machu Picchu on the same day you fly there. And this is a good idea also because then you don't get the, uh, the high altitude uh, of Cusco. Cusco is at 3,300 meters. So you don't really want to stay there the first night. You want to get down into the valley. So visit. Uh, Machu Picchu straight away, or you stay in the valley, yeah, and you can do that, and then you fly back the next day to Lima. So you can do that over two days. So five plus two, and uh, you could possibly fit in that Inca turn in the afternoon when you fly back from from Machu Picchu on yeah, the same day. And for the remaining, and for the remaining days, this. Statue tail. Yeah, so so the five days is for the statue tail in the northern. There are lots of good photography uh, opportunities there. So, and, and and you cannot really do the statue tail in less than five days. So, uh, right. okay. but that whole area because you fly into an, uh, an airport which is about well, if you go from that airport straight to the statue tail, it'll take you about eight hours to drive there, right? So what you do is you do stops on the way, but there are feeding stations for hummingbirds you get in five five days easily 40 species of hummingbirds maybe up to 50 species of hummingbirds on those five days uh, plus a lot of tanagers that i showed you also in the pictures great i've connected with you on social media so it would be easy to find you when it's time to go without okay see you next year See you next year. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.